Hello everyone and welcome to this September's quarterly Team Ministries online magazine. If you have not joined us before, you are very welcome. I'm Viv Pullman and we hope that in this very full programme there will be something to interest everyone. In this quarter we include some of the various activities of our churches over the summer months including the St Cuthbert's Rose Queen crowning and summer fair, the inter-church croquet match and inevitably something to do with strawberries. On a more serious note we take a look in at the work of the Children's Society and how we support it and we think of how we cope with criticism and our attitude to others. We travel back in time with the help of two church windows and look at many church rose queens down the generations. Let's begin this edition on a fine summer's day in June as young and old assemble outside St Cuthbert Church to begin a procession to the grounds of Meals Hall. You've guessed it. It is the annual Rose Queen crowning and summer fair. Our retiring Rosebud Queen, 
Miss Anna Cunliffe and her retinue. Our Rose Buds Queen elect, Miss Violet Furlong Dodd and her retinue. <laughs> for our next item. All three of our team churches have had Rose Queen crowning ceremonies down the generations and so now we take a backward glance at how the ceremonies have changed and recall names and faces from yesteryear.
years of St Cuthbert's annual Rose Queen crowning is a wonderful achievement, both for those who have been responsible for staging the event and for the young ladies who have worn the crown down through those years from 1943. At St John's in Crossens, the event goes back even further, in fact to 1906. From the archives, a little booklet produced in 1962 has this special photograph of the first Rose Queen in 1906, Jenny Waring, together with the Rose Queen for that year of 1962, Pauline Rainford. It is thought that the final Rose Queen crowning ceremony was held in 1995. Let's look back now and get a sense of the scale of these events with some archive film and photographs of times past. Sadly, most of them lack a name or a date, but the dress of the day gives some clues. St Stephen's Rose Queen crowning events give us something of a contrast because for the most part they are more recent and mostly in colour. Like the two other churches, the happiness and pride of those taking part and the families watching is very evident.
Rose queens, of course, grow up and move on. In concluding our item on rose queens down the years, we see here a group picture of former rose queens at St Stephen's, now just a few years older. The summer of 2023 has been both nationally and internationally a summer of sport. On a much more modest scale is our inter-church croquet match, played annually at Church Farm in Banks. This year St Cuthbert's was determined to win the Challenge Cup for a second year in a row. But St Stephen's Playing at home was equally determined. Let's watch now to see who came out on top. Maybe St John's outplayed them both. <laughs>
We are moments away from the big announcement. Just while we, we collect the trophy, um, it's, uh, it's really great privilege that, uh, that Tom's here again. Tom is here again to present the prize in memory of his, uh, his lovely wife, our Sylvia. The moment you've all been waiting for, this is the result of the team event. Big drum roll there in the corner. With five points, we have St Cuthbert's. St John's have ten points. And St Stephen's have 13 points. So this year, 2023, the winner of the Sylvia River Memorial Trophy is St Stephen's. Time now to slow the pace with a thoughtful Christian reflection. Roger Abram, one of our team's lay readers, helps us think about the topic of judging others and of being judged, and how easily do we accept helpful criticism. Hello. Today we're thinking about the aspect of judgment, and we commence with an overview from Jesus saying in Matthew chapter 7, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. God is the ultimate judge of his creation. He it is who bears the hurt of sin, and the opposite, namely, he who rejoices in righteousness. The Holy Spirit, God's active force, is always dynamic in our world, whether today or 2,000 years ago. As, where we read in Acts chapter 12, that as a matter of judgment on Herod for not giving praise to God, Herod was struck down and consumed by worms. Our final judgment, then, will occur when Jesus returns for his second coming. Turning now to Jesus' teaching, we might pose the question, why did Jesus highlight the effect of people passing judgment on others? In essence, nobody is perfect. We all have flaws. So which of us are in a position to consider the failure of others? Actually, it's an interesting question as to whether the Judaic society which Jesus inhabited 2,000 years past was less judgmental than our own today. The Jewish children and adults were indoctrinated with the Psalms as a template for Jewish daily living. Psalm 28 has an instructive sense of the dangers of judging others, so they knew it was unwise to judge others out of hand. In, in Psalm 28, we read, they speak cordially with their neighbors, but harbor malice in their hearts. Clearly, Jesus recognized that there was a problem, namely the unfair judgment of others accepting same matters of law. As such, this unfair judgment was a lurking cancer capable of destroying reputation and an affront to Jesus' second great commandment of loving one's neighbour as oneself. Of course, we can see Jesus' approach of how not to judge others simply by examining our own consciences before passing judgment on other people. Jesus succinctly instances a classic case in John chapter 8, where the situation of an adulterous woman was used by the scribes and Pharisees to test and trap Jesus, whose answer was, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. 
This, does it not, speaks for itself. An identical reasoning about not judging others occurs in that well-known illustration in Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus' sense of humour depicts how somebody with, say, a six-foot-long plank in his own eye is offering to remove a minuscule speck in a friend's eye. It's all a question, isn't it, of looking at our own image in the mirror first. Later, in a communication to the church in Rome, St Paul offers the same guidance. So St Paul says, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. Does this mean, then, that we must not harbour an opinion about somebody's actions? May I suggest, far from it, instead of judging people, what about compassion, patience, and a jolly good helping of Christian love? Is it not rather a matter of discernment, of knowing what we believe God might expect, and applying this to the particular situation in hand? St. Paul offers us an, ex an excellent example of sensible discernment as he speaks to the church in Philippi from his house arrest in Rome. He says this in Philippians chapter 1 as we read, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Surely, our conclusion must be that before we form an opinion, which we are perfectly entitled to do, of course, we exercise discernment, which will lead to a sensible God-centred judgment. We switch now to the subject of damaging or destructive criticism, especially on a personal level, such that can shred a person's reputation and even go as far as assassinating one's character. No doubt the setting for such personal damage can often be gossip, beyond that serious defamation. Gossip itself can be judgmental, and in a high proportion of instances could be harmful when spoken behind someone's back. Did you hear that Mrs. So-and-so's daughter is having an affair? There are no winners here. The gossiper will be seen for what that person is, whether the actual gossip is true or not. Mrs. So-and-so's daughter's previous good name will likely be impaired. Again, Jesus' teaching applies. The person making harsh, judgmental remarks is the one who will face a judgment. As we hear in St. Paul's letter to Titus, a member of his team, criticism can be turned around to face and confound the crit critic by Christian example. We read, In everything set then, an example by doing what is good. In your teaching show integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. On the other hand, we have constructive criticism. The Bible is a virtual plethora of helpful criticism which can be instructive for us. For example, Psalm 141 verse 5 asks for constructive criticism where we read, Let your faithful people correct and punish me. Hmm. Brave man. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus uses the story of the show-off pious Pharisee telling God how wonderful he is, compared with the downcast penitent tax collector seeking God's mercy, no doubt to constructively guide those who might choose to emulate the Pharisee, instead to follow the tax collector's example. There are, of course, other helpful avenues of constructive criticism. We should not, of course, ignore the power of prayer where we petition God to lead our thoughts, not forgetting the Sunday sermon. Additionally, we have church 
discussion and study groups, and not forgetting either our excellent team magazine. In summary, if we are to judge, it is better to be through Christian discernment, but never forgetting that the province of judgment for all of us will be Paul Jesus on his return. Thank you for listening. The Children's Society does a tremendously important work in giving children and young people care, support and a sense of being valued. The support that we can give, both individually and as a church, is part of our Christian love and concern for those who feel hurt and marginalised. In this item we see again the various ways that we do support the charity for children and families. The Children's Society has a Christian foundation and works with Christian standards and values, not least of all in valuing young lives. Through the year our three churches support the vital work of the Children's Society and we do this in various ways. Around Christmas our churches hold Christingle services, bright times of worship and fun with an important tangible message of support. Through the year many folk use a Children's Society collecting box in which they drop any loose change they have. And in the summer there is a strawberry tea which ideally takes place outdoors. This year, the July rains meant it had to be held inside. But whatever method we choose to support the Children's Society, we know we are supporting a valuable work, a work that values young lives. Here is just one example. Everything they said, we were just doing. We didn't have any choice. They sent us here and they passed us from one person to another person. I really miss my family a lot. We saw lots of people die. I was desperate for help. I couldn't even speak a word of English. I knew no one. I was homeless for three months. My case was getting passed around. I went for my first interview. They weren't nice. There was a lot of shouting, lots of questioning me and I was on my own. No lawyer, no anyone. I was told I have social workers, but I didn't know who social workers are. I said that I was young, but they didn't believe me. So they put me in a hostel. They thought I was 19, but I wasn't. I was 16. I was in a really bad place, like a living nightmare. 
I felt so let down. Then I met Alison from the Children's Society. They helped me a lot with my accommodation, home office meetings, and the meetings with my GP. I'm very grateful for all of their help. These people took me to the college. They put me through a course that I love, something I wanted to do. I want to be here, to be more settled. All I have is two brothers back home, so I have to make my own life here. And I feel like I am on the right path. In last quarter's online magazine, we looked at some of the wonderful stained glass windows in our three churches. As we saw, each window had a story to tell. The item proved so popular that we will look at them again. This time, we take just two windows, both interesting and significant to all of our three churches. This month we are going to consider two church windows, each of which has been dedicated to honour and remember a great character. One in living memory, and the other a name that resounds through the history of Southport some 125 years ago. Both of them were serving clergy in these churches of ours in what is now the North Meals Team Ministry. Let's go back in time to 1872, when a young man aged of 31 and only recently ordained was surprisingly offered the post as vicar of the newly built Church of St. Stephen's in the Banks. His name was William Thomas Bulpit. Before ordination, he had been teaching science at a school in Birmingham. Whatever the reason for appointing this inexperienced cleric to St. Stephen's, it turned out to be an inspired appointment. It is recorded that over the next six years of his ministry in Banks, he endeared himself to the people of the village. As a result of this dedicated efforts, a water main was laid for the village and water taps installed in every cottage. He played a significant part in making possible the extension of the West Lancashire Railway up to Preston, so opening up that market for farm and fish products from Banks Village. In 1878, William Bulpit was appointed Vicar of St John's Church in Crossens. He was looked on as something as an amateur medic and enthusiastic researcher of local history, but above all as a vicar who took a deep interest in and support of all the families in his parish. Having been a school teacher, education came high on his list of priorities, and he worked tirelessly to see a church school built next door to the church. One of the great works encouraged by him was the ongoing drainage of Martin Mere. It is difficult for us to grasp today the size and extent of the mere before it was drained, but as this sketch illustrates, it was larger than Lake Windermere. The result of this work was a significant increase in arable land to feed the expanding population. The Reverend William Thomas Bulpit retired in 1904 and died at the age of 73 years in September 1914 in Blackpool, to where he had retired. He had, he had served in St John's Crossens for 26 years and was buried in the churchyard there. 
His wife, Anne, presented a brass lectern as a memorial to him. There is a window in St John's bearing the board name. The two-section window is surmounted by the image of the pelican feeding her young. A fable has the story of the pelican slashing her chest and feeding her fledglings with her own blood. In that symbolism is the association with the Eucharist. On the other side is a crest. The left window shows the crest of Oxford University. There is some uncertainty about the crest to the right, but the nearest approximation is the crest of the Diocese of Lincoln. The window is situated above the altar on the east wall. As you can see, it illustrates to the left the Last Supper and to the right the crucifixion of Jesus. The artist who designed the window has given each of the disciples seated around the supper table different facial expressions. Some of them gaze with love and admiration at Jesus, one or two to the distance, perhaps pondering what tomorrow has in store, and those nearest the foreground focus on their fellow disciple Judas and give him a questioning look. It is the portrayal of Judas here that draws the eye he has a kind of cunning look about him, perhaps scheming in his mind about how he will carry out through his betrayal. He has already been paid for that. He is holding the bag of silver pieces. He is so preoccupied with his scheming that he has knocked over and spilt his cup of wine. And he has lost his halo. In the depiction of the crucifixion to the right, the two figures are Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John, often called the beloved disciple. The gospel accounts of the crucifixion record how from the cross, Jesus commits his mother into the care of his disciple, John. This account provides the perfect backdrop for the church at Crossens, dedicating as it is to St. John. However, before we move on to St Cuthbert's Church and hear the story of another great character, it is reasonable to assume that this window was installed in memory of the vicar, William T. Pulpit. Let's look again at the designation at the foot of the windows. It is slightly worn, but it seems to say, to the glory of God in memory of... blank blank... William Bulpit died 1885. It is a mystery because William Bulpit did not die in 1885, but in 1914. Because the lettering is indistinct in place and particularly by the name, could it be that this window is not in fact in memory of the late Vicar Bulpit, but someone else? Vicar Bulpit and his wife Anne had four daughters. Census records in 1871 and before ordination shows that the family living in Birmingham and includes a son, Frederick William, then aged six years. In 1881, Frederick is a student studying in Salford. By 1885, he's moved to Ormskirk, and there is a registration that records their son's death. He was just 21 years of age. It seems then that this window is not in memory of the vicar pulpit, but rather his and his wife's son, Frederick William pulpit. This window was placed there by parents in their time of grief and an expression of their love for a lost son. Eric Herbert Evans was born in Liverpool in 1902 and lived in Wavertree in Liverpool. 
His father was a master mariner, and with that influence in his life, Eric would go on to develop a ministry among seafarers. But more of that in a moment. He attended school at the Liverpool Institute. After leaving school, he worked for a time in the cotton trade, before going on to train for the ministry at the Bishop Wilson Theological College on the Isle of Man. He was ordained in Liverpool in 1929 and served his first curacy in Everton, and then moved to All Souls, Southport. With his interest for the sea, Eric became a chaplain at the Mersey Mission to Seamen in Liverpool. In those days, the Mission to Seamen was a national and international wing of the Anglican Church helping and supporting foreign seamen, particularly with some creature comforts and spiritual support while far away from their homes. It continues its work today, but has joined with other denominations to form the Mersey Seafarers Centre. Let's just hear a little more about its going on work today. Welcome to the Liverpool Seafarers Centre. Imagine being at sea for many weeks without sight of land. You're at the mercy of the elements and the increasing risk of pirate attack and have no contact with your loved ones. And when you reach port thousands of miles away, you have no guaranteed ticket home. That's what a seafarer can go through on a merchant vessel. To bring you the fuel for your car, almost everything you see in your home and the food that you eat. The Liverpool Seafarers Centre extends the hand of friendship to thousands of seafarers every year. We are a charity operating a frontline service to provide practical and emotional support for seafarers. Situated in the heart of Liverpool Docklands, we offer welfare services, advice, practical help, care and friendship. To help seafarers keep in touch with family and loved ones, the centre operates up to 30 phone lines and 10 internet bases. We also offer subsidised international SIM cards and mobile phones to use whilst in port. Recreational facilities include a library, bar and cafe, chapel and TV. We also provide transport and information about the City of Liverpool. Seafarers are also offered support in dealing with the emotional strain of being away from home for long periods of time. The centre is interdenominational, combining the Apostleship of the Sea, Stella Maris, and the Mersey Mission to Seafarers. Our chaplains are always ready to provide assistance and advice, irrespective of a person's beliefs or nationality. In July 1939, just before the outbreak of the war in September, Eric was instituted as the Vicar of St John's in Crossens. A, f a year later, and feeling a sense of duty, he enlisted in the Royal Navy Voluntary Reserve as a temporary chaplain, a role which he carried throughout the war years. In this capacity, he served on Russian convoy escorts and eventually became senior naval chaplain in India, based in Bombay. These duties, of course, took him away from Crossens and his parish responsibilities but as this parish magazine, Crossing Sentinel, shows, in his absence, the Reverend B.P. Watts took his place. Possibly because of such absence from his parish work, he felt he was letting down his congregation, because in that same parish magazine, he announces his resignation as vicar of St. John's. If the life of the parish is to be maintained and grow as it should, the sooner the parish has a permanent vicar, the better, and it is because of this conviction that I have resigned. With the war ended and his duties completed, it was time for him to move back into parochial ministry, and it was in 1948 that he was appointed rector of St Cuthbert's Churchtown, where he served for 20 years until 1968. Here are some glimpses of those years. In 
In that time, and recognising his considerable abilities, the Bishop of Liverpool, Bishop Clifford Martin, appointed him Archdeacon of Warrington in 1959, a post he held until his retirement in 1970. Eric Evans retired to Ainsdale and died on Christmas Day 1977 at the age of 75. It's so it was fitting that a window should be installed in St Cuthbert's in memory of the venerable Eric Herbert Evans. Here is that window, which is dedicated by the Bishop of Warrington, Michael Henshaw, in 1981. The window was designed and made by Carl Edwards, who had designed the striking west window of Liverpool Cathedral, which was being made around the same time. As you see, the window is in two sections. The first incorporates the arms of the Diocese of Liverpool, and the right version is the arms of the Borough of Southport. The motto below the second window reads, Salus Populi, the health of the people. The illustration of the anchor reminds us of the Archdeacon's involvement with the sea and seafarers. The Liverpool Diocesan coat of arms was only authorised in 1882, some two years after the creation of the diocese. Its new bishop, John Charles Ryle, insisted that the image of a Bible be included. The eagle, represented as it does, St John the Evangelist, was taken from the ancient seal of the Burgess of Liverpool in 1229. The ship, of course, signifies the important shipping port that Liverpool had become. As indicated, the other coat of arms is that of the borough of Southport. This particular representation is the older form, as it was changed in 1923, when the rowing boat was replaced by the galley. Two windows in two of our churches, each reminding us of two great characters serving God and each with their own unique style of ministry. And so that's all for this quarter's online team magazine. We hope you have enjoyed it and found something new and interesting. Thank you to everyone who has had a hand in bringing it to you. The next Quarters magazine will be coming to you at the beginning of December. But look out for other programmes on our YouTube channel before then. You will be able to view our programmes as soon as they appear if you subscribe to our channel. Just press the subscribe button on the screen and it's free. Anyway, that's all for now. Goodbye and thank you for watching.